Hi guys, welcome to the Star Wars Lads. My name is Sonic, and I'd like to give a little bit of an update slash refresher on where things stand currently in the Star Wars universe. We just finished the first season of The Bad Batch, and in my mind and Liam's mind, this is probably the strongest first season out of any animated Star Wars show. I mean, we've had The Clone Wars, which had turned out to being something totally incredible, but that first season was a little rough around the edges, and it took really until that third season for the show to truly shine. Um, Rebels also was a solid show. It had its issues here and there, but it was really more in that second season where things really picked up. Star Wars Resistance was a little bit more of a low-key show, not really the biggest thing that Lucasfilm was trying to put out there. And it had some good episodes, especially in the latter half of season one, but it's not really one of the top tier shows that came out. And obviously, we've had The Bad Batch come out now, which is a sort of epilogue, sort of con continuation of The Clone Wars. And yeah, I mean, it turned out pretty well so far. And there's a season two coming out next year. And next year is going to be a really, really big year for Star Wars. And I mean, look, we're in the golden age of Star Wars. We've gotten so much content in the form of books, comics, video games, and movies. If anything, that's the weakest part right now. It is the video games. And even then, we've gotten some great stuff like Jedi Fallen Order in the last few years. And we're going to get a little bit of a preview for LEGO Star Wars Skywalker Skaga at Wednesday at Gamescon. So... Hopefully that means that we might get a winter, December, Christmas release. Who knows? It, it's to be determined. But as far as how 2022 is shaping up to be, man, it's going to be exciting. Just a week ago, we got the news that Kenobi had finished up wrapping, which was surprising since we thought Andor would be the one to finish first um, since it had started much earlier. But Andor also just finished wrapping up just yesterday, so that puts... Two of the biggest shows coming out next year in a really great position. And, I mean, we're all big Star Wars fans. We love Obi-Wan Kenobi. And the Kenobi show is probably the most anticipated of all the Disney Plus shows coming out next year. Obviously, we have a couple things before that. And that includes the Book of Boba Fett. And before that, Star Wars Visions, which is a bunch of anime short films that are going to really not be canon but they're going to be fun experiments and you know inquiries into how the Star Wars formula can connect with the anime formula. And as 2D animation and anime has only grown more and more popular in the last few years, it's only in Star Wars' best interest to really do something animated. I know a lot of you guys might have seen online a couple years back that Star Wars 80 style anime and a uh, version of TIE Fighter, and it's got some crazy awesome synth and rock music and really intense fight, dog fighting in space and it's really a trailer but the interest is clearly there for more Star Wars so Visions is going to be fun. Um, Book of Boba Fett is going to be our first of the Mandalorian spin-offs that's coming out and yeah it's not necessarily something that you know if you're a Mandalorian exclusive fan you're excited for but if you are a big long time Star Wars fan I mean this is the OG Mandalorian getting his show getting his own due he had a really great turn in the second season of The Mandalorian, and it's cool to see him back in action and kicking ass, but, you know, he's not exactly as naive or simple-minded as Din Djar in The Mandalorian as with Grogu and his whole mission. Um, Boba Fett is the galaxy's most notorious bounty hunter, trained by Jango Fett, and he is a clone of his father, so dealing with all the stuff that we've seen in the Clone Wars from him, all the things that we've seen in the Galactic Civil War original trilogy period with him, and now post-original trilogy with him getting back his armor, having escaped from the Sarlacc pit. This show has a lot of things going for it, and we might see a lot of, a lot of cool characters like Black Chrysanthemum, who is basically Chewbacca but roided up and with all these illegal modifications. We might see possibly Dr. Afra, who is, you know, never quite dead, is always popping up, um, would be pretty interesting to see. And there's some interesting things coming from the comics, like possibly Dengar, possibly Valence, Crimson Dawn um, coming back and getting its own comic series, as Liam mentioned in our comics video last week, Crimson Rain. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that that 
criminal underworld that Boba is really going to throw himself back into now that he's got Jabba's palace. It's really Boba's palace now. Um, obviously, there are a few other things going on, but one question that starts like really creeping up in people's mind, especially as we venture into kind of like a month or so without major Star Wars content, which, guys, we've been blessed. There's been so many things happening in Star Wars that this is like one of the few breaks. What about the sequels? And the sequels are, you know, the first big medium content that was created under Disney since their purchase. And whether you love or hate them, they are how you finish up the Skywalker saga, episode one through episode nine. You don't have to love all those films, but they are there. They do tell a story, even if it's not perfect and clean at many different points throughout all three trilogies. A bigger issue is what are we doing with the sequels now? I mean, obviously, The Mandalorian has become such an unprecedented success. Next year, we're going to go back into the prequel memes well that is Obi-Wan Kenobi and having a fully dedicated show to him. Um, we're going to have a lot more Bad Batch coming out, so we're going to still stick with that prequel era. And obviously, Book of Boba Fett will be done at some point in, let's say, January or so. What gives? Like, what, what's next for the sequels? Are we just going to ignore them? I know a lot of people have been trying to say, like, oh, we're going to somehow reintroduce the Mortis arc and retcon this whole timeline. It's not going to happen. The, the sequels are Disney's baby. They're almost impossible to just wipe off. And honestly, they're really solid films all throughout. And a lot of the criticisms that are leveled against it, such as, you know, incoherent plot, Characters that are really wishy-washy or overpowered, you know, not really providing much setup, being confusing, being all action, not really a story. They're valid. They're fair criticisms, but they're also the same criticisms that we've gotten for the prequel trilogy. And myself, I grew up as a prequel fan as well as Liam. I mean, that was our Star Wars for us from... 1999 to 2005 those movies were the big thing for star wars obviously we've also enjoyed and maintained with star wars since then so the clone wars is as big if not bigger for us but those were those three movies and you can make a lot of arguments that those movies don't do such a great job either i mean let's just look at episode one right it's an interesting sort of side plot that starts off this whole chain reaction that is the Skywalker saga, but what effect does it really have other than to bring Anakin into the story, to get Qui-Gon out of the story, to set up Obi-Wan with Anakin, and to kind of just, you know, connect Anakin and Padme into having a little bit of an intertwined fate. Outside of that, it's really just stunning visual pieces put together kind of showing the decay of the Republic with the politics that people didn't really enjoy, but were truly important because Star Wars has always been political in its nature. But instead of picking off from that, we just jump ahead 10 years and almost have a soft reset with Attack of the Clones. Attack of the Clones, guys. Um, I mean, it's literally just right before the Clone Wars happens. We enter into a state of the galaxy where so many people are leaving to join this confederacy under a former Jedi who goes by the name of Count Dooku now and, you know, has been somewhat beloved even by the Jedi despite leaving the Order and taking up his, you know, fame and wealth and name and title to the planet Serrano. We don't get really much else in between those 10 periods. We know that Anakin's grown up. We know that Obi-Wan has been his master and they're still master and apprentice at this point. The only really thing that, thing that we have that really kicks off this entire movie is that Padme is trying to get her and a bunch of other senators to go against Palpatine, who has stayed in office for quite a while and is trying to kind of bring this big galactic army to the front. And at this moment, you know, no one really thinks, hey, there's a war that's about to erupt. It's more like, hey, let's not get carried away. Let's use our politicking, our communication, and just understand that the well-being of the galaxy is at stake if we just 
throw in a full military force under our command. That's not really what the values of the Republic are. Yeah, a bunch of things happen. I mean, we get Padme and Anakin's sort of romance. It's it's not the prettiest thing. I mean, I love Sand, but Anakin hates Sand. There's a lot of different things that happen. Obi-Wan has a really interesting espionage mission of sorts where he finds out about the Kaminoans, who are only now in 2021 really getting a bigger and deeper understanding of in the Bad Batch. But he just finds out that Master Sifo Diaz had already set up a whole army 10 years before. Essentially, right after the Phantom Menace. We get a nugget of information for that. Just nuggets in the sixth season of The Clone Wars. And not much else. Not much else. So, story-wise, there's a lot of disconnects there. All we know is that whatever happened in Episode 1, it's not truly essential other than just bringing people together. And setting up Anakin towards a path that is more difficult and is going to pull him down eventually. Who does he lean on? Palpatine. And we do see some of those things in episode 3. But in episode 2, it's it's politics and it's Geonosis. And there's the Kaminoans being mixed in those two. That was a, that's really how you can look at the ent- entire second film. And yeah, the romance. It's not great, but it's there. Episode 3, which is one of my favorite films, Revenge of the Sith. I mean, it's fantastic for many different reasons, but we're in the thick of the Clone Wars as it's coming to an end. That's a whole huge leap. The thing that had been mentioned just one off in Episode 4, A New Hope, the original Star Wars film, starts and ends. That's how it is in the movies. There's, There's not much else to it. Until, obviously, the Clone Wars that happens. And the seven seasons split across Cartoon Network, Netflix, and finally finding a good resting place in Disney Plus all collected together. I mean, there was even Clone Wars Legacy on the Star Wars website, which was unfinished arcs. I mean, the whole of that story is done in animation. The beginning and end are the only things that are in live action. And for a lot of fans, after hearing that throwaway line about the Clone Wars... From Kenobi in the very first Star Wars film, you know, you'd expect to see a little bit more of it in the story. And it was also unexpected. A lot of people in the 70s and 80s thought Clone Wars meant like clones of people and famous Jedi and politicians and whoever it may be. Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan. Think about it. Like it was a genuine theory that held some weight. Until Lucas started working on the prequel trilogy, the only thing that people really knew about clones per se came from the Heir to the Empire trilogy where Thrawn uses cloning cylinders and fills up his whole fleet in the Katana fleet that he has. Besides that, not much else there. And episode 3, as wonderful as it is, picks up at the end of what is supposed to be such a deep, rich, and engaging conflict. We've already seen all those things in the Clone Wars and how we understand there are multiple wars that are happening instead of a singular Clone War. But that movie doesn't really set up things well either. We see, obviously, the fall of Anakin in this film. But it's rushed. It's mostly because of Padme being pregnant and his fear of seeing a Force vision of her dying during childbirth. It happens. It kind of feels like a switch is flicked on from that hero that we see at the beginning of the film. And it's understandable. It's a very emotional thing, especially for a guy who we'd seen in episode two lose his mother after not seeing her for 10 years, right? Dying in his arms. So, yes, that storyline makes sense, but there are gaps. There are gaps. So many gaps. And his how he changes and flips on the Jedi, just chooses to go with Palpatine. Yes, we can see from Hayden's expressions, from just the way he's emoting, it's the most painful thing that he's done. But is it really justified in that runtime? What I'm trying to get here at is, even in the prequels, as strong of a story as it is, yes, story is strong because performances, you can argue about. Visually, there are arguments for and against, but 
story-wise, it is probably the best out of all three trilogies. It's complicated, but not in a way that feels kind of meandering and unsettling like the sequels. It's filled with action and stakes like the original trilogy, but it does a lot of more connective tissue without some sort of retcon, such as Leia ending up being Luke's sister after kissing him in Empire Strikes Back. There are all these little gaps that happened in the prequels, and yet now, since 2015, we've always just assumed that the prequels are these wonderful things. It became wonderful because of a show called The Clone Wars. Clone Wars showed us so many characters with so much depth that we'd known about, and even supporting characters that we'd only seen in the background of the films who became such fan favorites, such as like Plo Koon. The clones themselves became such rich, rich characters that the Bad Batch felt like a very justified show, and we feel for them as they see Kamino being destroyed, and we can hear the pain in that voice of that clone trooper as he reports to Rampart that Topoka City is completely destroyed and under the water. There are these things that Star Wars has filled throughout its history. I mean, back in the 90s, just the gap between episode 5 and episode 6, which is somewhere between 6 weeks to 6 months, we had a whole freaking comic book, a book, and a game come out of it that filled in all the different things that led to the start of Return of the Jedi. You could also say that the prequels don't have that same sort of love and respect to a degree, even though that gap between the three years of episode 2 and 3 are flooded with Clone Wars content. You just gotta go before to episode 2 and that gap to episode 1. That is 10 years. And in canon and in Legends, it was barely explored. The only thing we really have in canon is the Obi-Wan Kenobi miniseries and the Anakin little segments of that story. Like, that's really it. There are some hints and things that are here in guidebooks and whatnot, but that's 10 years. Even if these characters don't interact for 10 years, the galaxy's changed a lot in 10 years, and we still don't know that. So, when people criticize the sequels, yes, a lot of it is valid. Absolutely. There are things that I don't like. I mean, personally, for myself, I rank it as The Last Jedi, followed by The Rise of Skywalker, but then by The Force Awakens. And people love The Force Awakens. But a lot of us also thought it was really a rehash of sorts. You know, just a combination of the best beats of the original trilogy with very little setup for what's coming next and that setup that's there is very confining yeah you could have left a year or two ahead with ray's training but it's the resistance with the new republic destroyed that timeline wouldn't have made sense whereas at the end of a new hope the biggest super weapon of the galaxy has ever seen is destroyed and the empire is reeling to a rebellion that has only gained strength and has now gotten their huge victory First Order was somewhat accepted and kind of dealt with in almost like a real world parallel to how in before World War II, Nazi Germany was okay handled and the, Clone War, uh, Clone, the Cold War standoffs between the Soviet Union and the United States. Thing is, there's a lot of great story and setup to these sequels, but it's not there yet. So... It's fair to say the movies themselves are not great. There are three individual stories that are loosely connected to some degree, but I mean, what does it make sense? Why come back to it? And I think that's really the biggest thing that Disney has to deal with because that is their baby. But at the same time, they've already shown a willingness to actually continue and grow and interconnect that story. I mean, let's, let's just look at the setup that's being made. In the latest Darth Vader comic, the 2020 series, we see Darth Vader after going through his whole conflict about knowing that his son is alive, that his son abandoned him instead of turning to the dark side and helping him rule the galaxy, and dealing with the fallout of Padme and everything that happened in Naboo, he goes to Exegol because he thinks that he can defeat and take on uh, his master, Palpatine, after Palpatine punishes him for 
the failures of the Empire Strikes Back and what has happened since. I mean, Vader knows that his time is running out if he doesn't do something and submit. But at the same time, this is a Vader that's changing. And that Vader that changed still went to Exegol, the home of all the Sith alchemy, where we see all these Star Destroyers that are being made. The contingency that sets up everything in Episode Nine is already being planted right there. If you want something that's much bigger than the comics, you only have to look at the Mandalorian Season 2. When we're back at Navarro, which is the starting planet of the whole series, Mando comes back and has to help deal with something going on at an old Imperial base that's still on the planet. Obviously, we've seen the Imperial Remnant is still around five years after Return of the Jedi. But once they get in there, they find some really, really interesting characters. We see these tubes filled with these strange creatures and they sort of kind of look like Snoke. Even if they're never going to be Snoke, it's proto-Snoke. It's something. It's The idea is that there's some sort of cloning, some sort of strange things going on. And we literally see a recording of Dr. Pershing. Well, Dr. Pershing's wearing these strange, interesting robes that we've seen in the first season. And they showed up again in the Bad Batch. At the very end of this first season... After Kamino and Topoka City and all those facilities are destroyed, Nala Se is transported to a planet, to a, a Legends era base that I'm forgetting the name of, but it's being brought back in the canon. It's where a lot of dark secrets and cloning were done for Palpatine after he became the Emperor. Emperor, and well, what do you know? The people who greet Nala Se are wearing the same exact uniform. They are making these threads happen. And if you look at the Star Wars website, they released a really, really interesting thing. It was an article titled, Star Wars Inside Intel, Palpatine's Contingency Plan. So even if you don't like it, they're making it seem like, okay, Palpatine always had a plan. And we've seen things, seen things that he's done some degree of chaos and change to the galaxy post-death. Some of the earliest stuff in canon was Operation Cinder and everything that we see in the original battle from Battle of Jakku, right? That's literally in Episode 7. Cinder destroyed so many planets through turbulent storms and just geolog geological quakes and all these different things. Gallius Rex gets all the Imperial Remnant that's there to Jakku and they get destroyed. And there's some strange, strange ancient Sith base of sorts where he falls into after being killed by Ray Sloan and this kid was raised in the prequel era under Palpatine's care for so many years this guy Palpatine is a mastermind he's done things forever and ever and ever it it's not great how it's executed in those movies I'll give you that but the story does give space for this to happen and you could might say okay you know, it's a little unsettling to think that Han, Leia, and Luke's whole journey is a failure. Everything they've done is failure. No, they still gave the galaxy 30 years of peace. They just didn't account for a man refusing to die. They didn't account for, you know, Vader turning into Anakin and never coming back. That his spirit was freed. They didn't think that the Sith Lord would have the capability not having a force ghost, but being able to just live on, keep his essence going. But anyways, in this article specifically, the sentence goes as this. Destiny and the contingency will catch up to Rey in the form of the First Order, led by one of Palpatine's evil duplicates called Snoke. Now, we've called Snoke a strand cast in the past. We've had those things thrown around in encyclopedias. You know, a strand cast is a sort of combination of you know, the clone that you're trying to derive the cells from mixed with a bunch of other different things. It's a loose thing. It can be played around with, sure. But the fact that he's called Palpatine's evil duplicate not only makes Snoke, interestingly, maybe a failed Palpatine clone, but 
allows, you know, Palpatine to just, like, do his own little refresh without actually having the hands to get all grubby and dirty. Step in when one of these two, Rey, the granddaughter of a f- of his own making, you know, from a son that doesn't have the Force, who marries, has a child, and tries to get Ochi to bring her back before that whole mess happens on Jakku, or... Ben Solo, the son of Han Solo, and more importantly, Leia Organa, or more specifically, Leia Skywalker, is Anakin's daughter. You know, we don't know if Luke has had any sort of relationships with children. At this point, it looks a little unlikely for him to have offspring, considering that they should have had an impact into the story of the sequels. But regardless... Now we've got this idea that Palpatine just let something created from him, whether it be organically from a relationship born from his own experimentations, or quite literally a direct clone that was manipulated in many strange ways, that set up this whole sequel trilogy. And I mean, it's not perfect, but we're getting to that point. The cloning threads is happening. The things that we've noticed and just were introduced to, like a little bit of backstory and race parents, are being connected in. And I mean, finally, we got to look at the biggest thing that's come out of that show. Luke and Grogu. Grogu is being chased after by this Imperial Remnant for his blood. I mean, it makes sense. Yoda was such a powerful Force user. But there's something strange about his species too. We assumed that when Yoda was 50, he was... An adult of some sorts, but Grogu's 50 and he's a baby. So there's an element of aging, and then there's the element of the force power that he has. And Din Djarin keeps him away from all the mess that he originally is supposed to bring him back into. These experimentations by these Kamino-derived scientists like Dr. Pershing. But in the end of Season 2, we get Luke making an appearance, destroying everybody and then taking Grogu to be trained. So now there's a little bit of a connection to Luke's temple and what's going on with Kylo at this point, Ben Solo. Does he show up in a few years to the temple? You know, we're we're building the steps there. And yeah, I mean, it's not perfect. Don't get me wrong. But their steps are being made and Disney, for all its failures with the sequels, is doing its best to make it such an essential part that it is the closeout of things that have happened over a 30-year period. And they're trying to also possibly do right by these original characters that they created. Um, John Boyega was very outspoken about how he felt kind of misled by being marketed as like the big Jedi force-wielding hero of the sequels. You know, with the remember the iconic lightsaber pose posters that were out there, and just the fact that you see him in the trailer fighting. Sure, I'm not opposed to Ray being the star. I think it works well enough. But you know, the only thing we really get out of Finn is he has a small mini connection to other runaway stormtroopers who are freed by from their brainstorming. So he doesn't have a true revolt, a stormtrooper rebellion. That he could have been part of. But he's also given for sensitivity. Which kind of works throughout all three movies. I mean he holds up fairly well against Kylo. And he does sense Rey and everything going on. In the third movie. And it's obviously been happening before the Rise of Skywalker. At least in that one year period where he's aware that hey. Maybe I have the force. But we don't get him as a Jedi. We don't get him really wielding a lightsaber once again. And... The rumor that has been put out there is that he might be getting his own Disney Plus show. Despite John Boyega's original misgivings, it seems like he might have cleared some things up. The rumor is that he could have a Disney Plus show. And I know originally he said he'd never Disney Plus himself. But, I mean, we've seen how successful The Mandalorian is. We've seen how big those MCU shows are. And the rumor comes from the hashtag show. And they're saying... That they're trying to, you know, take a movie concept and turn it into a Disney Plus show starring John Boyega. While this should be taken with a grain of salt, 
this does fall in line with kind of how the Kenobi show happened. It was supposed to be a trilogy of movies, and that didn't really work out. A lot of writers came in and out, and finally, it was made into a Disney Plus show, which, as I mentioned at the top of this long rant, has just finished filming a week ago. So we're going to be seeing that in a few months, honestly. So maybe we get to see a little bit of things pre the force awakens and post the rise of skywalker we're hearing that in the book of boba fett in that same way we're going to see possibly the escape from the sarlacc or at least some things with empire era boba and then post empire era as we've seen in the mandalorian as he has now ascended to the throne at Jabba's palace so yeah i mean if this is the first big thing that disney does that's directly connected to the sequels instead of 10 15 years out in the future or something in a comic or a book this is going to be big and i think that the fact that every single medium of star wars could be potentially used and a main character from the movies is allowed to come back and really become the character he was always meant to be we're going to look at the sequels a lot differently you asked me in 2008 yes i love the prequels but you ask someone else who was in their 20s and 30s, it's a hit or miss. Even the story wasn't appreciated back then, which we are still milking to such a strong degree because that's just how many layers and levels there are to it. The sequel story is a lot more convoluted, but there are things that can be done setting it up over 30 years that seem to already be in place and things that you can do directly after. I mean, the rumor is the Rogue Squadron film is also set after the Rise of Skywalker. So maybe we see some stuff with like First Order Remnants, you know, occupying Coruscant. So there are a lot of different things where these storylines can all intermingle and kind of re be revamp the story of the sequels as we know it. I mean, I'm going to just end it here, but think about it. Just 10 years ago, we thought Anakin was a whiny little brat becomes an even bigger whiny little brat who then suddenly kills off all the Jedi and says some really corny lines like, I hate sand, you know, and all those different things. I mean, yeah, he emotes really well, but he doesn't really seem like a romantic soul who's hurt and weighed in by a lot of different things that causes him to turn to the dark side. It just seems like, hey, the fear of losing his wife was enough to just make him go crazy. And... It works well, not amazingly well, but it works well. But a prequel fan now will say, no, no. There were three years of him being misled by the Jedi, even Obi-Wan doing things behind his back. He lost Ahsoka Tano because of the Jedi's arrogance. And when he was about to get her back, when she could have made a difference in his life, all the things in Revenge of the Sith happened. The Clone Wars, he was a great hero with no fear. And yet so many different things show that he had a lot of fear and pain. He chokes Poggle the Lesser. He's so against the Zygerian slavers because it reminds him of his childhood trauma. There are just so many different things about losing many clone brothers like Fives and Rex. And just the genuine betrayal of the Jedi who have done so much for him but have also in so many ways kept so many things from him. And on top of all that... Things like Clovis and Padme and his relationship becoming more and more toxic from that dream-like ethereal state that they were in in Attack of the Clones. Yeah, so when Padme could possibly die, it's not the reason for him falling into his despair and his path of falling down to the dark side and submit, submitting to Sidious and Palpatine. It's the cherry on top. It's the one... Jenga piece that's left holding everything together as he's become more chaotic and more burdened, more angry, more frustrated with everything that the war has brought out of him. War hurts everybody. The kid who's got so much more pressure than anyone else and for a while withstood everything and was doing great, but when was again submitted to the same patterns of abuse and torture and lying by enemies and friends alike he's not one of the best star wars characters out there 
He was always one of the more interesting ones just because of those situations he was in because of the original trilogy and how he becomes Vader. But his story in the prequels is now genuinely some of the most amazing things. And the Vader stuff has only gotten better with the three main Vader lines, you know, the ones that set right after Revenge of Sith from Charles Soule, the Karen Gillan one from 2015, and the Greg Pak one that's going on right now that's really allowing us to see Anakin to Vader to Anakin again. But 10 years ago, that doesn't really fit. The only thing that was great about Anakin was maybe his fighting, the moments of Revenge of the Sith, and then all the original trilogy when he's Vader. The same thing can happen to the sequels. The same thing can happen to someone like Finn. Rey can become something more. Who knows? Somehow maybe Kylo Ren, Ben Solo can come back in a way that's more exile and more rebirth, if we're going to say and a little bit more of a biblical angle if we're going to continue what Anakin created with his whole chosen one, no father at birth sort of storyline. There's a lot of different things that Disney can do. And there are so many creators in Star Wars that it's possible. And the overarching storyline is going to be fixed. They should have had one in the first place, but it's going to be fixed. It's not going to be perfect, but I mean, the prequels aren't perfect. And yet we love them. We have so many memes of the prequels. And yet, I this is just me personally, when I see prequel fans bash the sequels, you're forgetting that it's you're just continuing the same sort of misleading, painful things that have happened to you onto a fan who just has gotten into Star Wars because of the sequels. Just, just give it time. Give it time, folks. I think with this whole rant over... It makes a little bit of sense to give the benefit of doubt with so many great things happening like the High Republic, all these Disney Plus shows and everything else in Star Wars right now. Because really, we're in the golden age and the golden age is only starting. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.